different kinds of powders. So here, this size over here is about 5 microns, okay? And you can see big agglomerates, sort of what you might see with the zirconia nanoparticles, for instance. This is alumina. This is silicon carbide, and now that's also 5 microns. What differences do you see between these two? Size of the particles are very different. That's one very good thing. Then what else? Anything else? Agglomeration could be another thing, right? So now let's go from there. This is also 5 microns in that size. And uh, some things that you see over here, that's aluminum nitride. As you go from here to here to here. So some of the packing might be a little bit different between these. And then some shape is also different along with the size, right? And then you go into something like this, fi also 5 microns. And these are uh, your silica microspheres. Right? What differences do you see? OK, so they're spheres, and they're also now, instead of a distribution of sizes, you're getting a monosized. Right? So now these are, yeah, so now the sh now you have like, you have continuous fiber or s discontinuous fibers. And so properties are going to be different. In this case, it's silicon nitride. Okay. This is also silicon nitride. And now you're dealing with nanoparticles. And then finally, these are some clay particles. Okay. And that's about five microns in size. So platelets. So pl platelets, fibers, spheres, irregular shapes, agglomerates, so on and so forth. Right? Diversity in shape, size, the width of the size distribution, and all of them can make a difference in terms of how you can work with it in terms of powder polymer mixtures and what you can do with it from there. Right? So then the key challenge is how do we know what size we are working with? And then from there, build the logic in terms of how do we know what size and shape are most important for what you're trying to do? Right? And if you're stuck, so that allows you to select not only a material, but between different types of powders, what is most applicable. The other thing is you will know to design that for this particular end application, this particular property, I will look for being able to work with the size range, the shape characteristic, this packing behavior. Okay. So shape, in terms of measuring those properties or monitoring that, we've got to look at what options are available. How do we, if it's a sphere, we know what to do. Right? When it's an irregular particle, how do we begin to see what to do with it? If it's a tube, what happens? Right? Of course, size. Some particles are in a certain size range. Other particles are in another size range. Right? Few, micro, few microns, few hundreds of microns, few nanometers, few hundreds of nanometers. What techniques are available to be able to measure all those different attributes. Some are dispersed, some are not. So then how can we tell? Some have different shapes, and then accordingly the size number that we get, how is that dependent upon size? These are, so those are interrelated. Density makes a major thing, and then there are a lot of different types of density. Right? You have the theoretical density of any material, and depending upon the purity and the crystallinity, it's going to change. But then beyond that, density as it attributes to packing, right? Packing different shapes, sizes, how do they affect the packing behavior in terms of how much powder can you fit in a given volume, as opposed to how much mass you can fit in a given volume, right? Talk about surface area then, you know, for a lot of applications, surface area matters. And when you're dealing with powders and sintering operations, the ability to take that surface area and provide it as a driving force to 
promote diffusion from one powder surface to another powder surface, this is like a big thing that we have to worry about, right? How do you measure that? How do, and depending upon the size ranges, what is the accuracy of doing something like that? And when are there direct measures, are there indirect measures? Right? Talk about porosity, pore structure. So not only pore size, pore distribution, right? Pore uni uh, so the pore uniformity, and how you can do that, whether they're closed pores, whether they're interconnected pores. Chemical composition probably makes a whole bunch of difference for all the surface properties that we are looking at, right? Whether it's dispersion, whether it's catalysis, whether it's the bio properties, whether it's the photoactivated properties, and so on, right? So how is the chemical composition making a difference? But then beyond that, the chemical composition also affects the centering response and the final properties from there, right? So for instance, standard example is you change the amount of carbon in iron and you're going to get a whole range of mechanical properties, correct? You to add some, some other elements in there, corrosion properties are going to change, strength is going to change, heat treating response is going to change. So if the chemical composition changes, right, what happens? You talked about a couple of different kinds of iron st structures, or stainless steel structures, right? In your research that you're looking at, right? Ferritic and austenitic steels. So what may, so what are the uh, what are the responses over there? And then when you're heating that, what happens to the additives? Do they get uniformly distributed? Do they escape from the surface? Right. For instance, chromium and steel is important for surface corrosion properties and biocompatible bio response. If, the, if you're heating this, chromium oxide can evaporate from the surface. Right. So what you started out as a chemistry is different from what a chemistry you end up with. You're heating a powder polymer mixture. If the polymer breaks down, what, does, what elements does it provide typically? Right. You take a polymer, typical po organic polymer, and you heat it, it decomposes. What elements does it leave behind? Do you know? Can you think? What contamination comes into the steel? So you take some stainless steel, and you mix it with, say, polyethylene. Now you're heating it after you created the shape, and you're decomposing polyethylene. What elements are left behind? What chemical com uh, contamination? Carbon, right? Carbon is good, and then carbon dioxide can be with the, sur with the surface oxide. But what happens when carbon from the polymer goes into the stainless steel? Right? You, and so you begin to change properties. So what, depending upon how you process, you are going to, you have the li likelihood of contaminating something. Right? If it is tantalum or any no, any no, material like titanium tantalum and so on, the sensitivity to carbon, nitrogen, oxygen is a lot more. Right? Depending upon the atmosphere, you heat up something. Right? <coughs> if it's an oxide, that's great. You heat it in air and you're done. But if it's a metal and you don't, or if it's a precious metal, right? suppose you're working with a rhodium, uh, or a platinum, or something like that, or palladium. Right? You begin to heat it in air, it's a big problem. Right? For you, for oxygen, nitrogen, oxynitride, right? what you do with tantalum makes a major difference. So chemical composition, how to start out with the right composition, how to end up with the right composition. How can you tell? Right? Then we talked about phys phase structure, physical structure, so on, right? In terms of right, austenitic, ferritic, martensitic, streels, so on. How does that affect what you're doing? How does that affect in terms of not only the crystal structure and the phase, but also the grain boundaries, and uh, how does that get controlled from there on? Right? So these are some kinds of common considerations that we have to deal with in terms of defining the powder characteristics that we start with, and eventually how that affects mixtures, mixing, molding, shape forming, binder removal, 
centering responses right so our idea of first characterization is what are we starting with and then as we learn different kinds of processes chemistries and so on we get an and appreciation of what is the dependence of that starting material on how we continue with the rest of the process so for instance this is like the uh, the powder characterization lab that jupiter came almost 10 years ago to penn state and there are a lot of different tools a lot of people running around and so you have many different options right which option works best for what you're trying to do right is some type of uh, thing that we have to look at the key reason for looking at characterization is from our perspective in this course is how does it link to the response of the system during processing right how do you control the process so that you reduce defects reduce waste how do you anticipate changes right? you want something but you have something else how can you adjust the process to make sure that you can control the behavior right not through trial and error but by understanding that if i work with this this is what the things that i have to change so how to build the logic structure when you're working with powders to the point that you can link the characteristics to the overall response right that's what we want to build towards it's not going to come just like that over a period of time you begin to build that logic structure in your research and in your career what you have to know is that these are connected you change what you start with you change what you end up with and how you end up making things right so whether it's research development or whether it's in manufacturing but largely then the big area is liability protection especially when you get into healthcare right you take something you put it into the body and someone dies and maybe about 100 people die you take it and you put it into a car and then suddenly the, there are a whole bunch of accidents the brakes are not working correctly or you know something happens whose fault is it right is it the car manufacturer is a medical device manufacturer is it the guy who is supplying the parts is it the guy supplying the powders when you know the interrelationship between specification of the powder and the parts that you make with it the components that you make with it right you begin to set controls on what you can work with and if the manufacturer ends up the powder vendor ends up promising one type of particle characteristics and ends up providing a different sets of characteristics and that affects the parts that are made if you are a powder vendor you are in trouble if you are a parts vendor and you do not understand the relationship you are also in trouble right so those are some reasons at different levels where you begin to pay attention to right starting from the research lab and your research project as to understanding the interrelationships right to being able to go towards what is the best powder to work with and, and why and then the theme of the class as we are building towards the end of the class and then towards your research projects is if i make the particles small enough so that they become nano then what is changing and that opens its doors to a whole lot of possibilities can i control that change can i take advantage of that change can i prefer to not choose that option at all if it's too many problems to solve right working with nanoparticles is great but if it prevents you from doing what you want maybe you want to do something else right nanotubes is wonderful but is there some simpler solution so the main things is in terms of understanding the links to behavior and how it affects processing the first thing is the size and the shape combination will affect packing how much powder can we put into a polymer it will 
affect the flow behavior either the powder by themselves so large particles and spherical particles if you are pouring into a dye by itself is going to flow freely nanoparticles and irregular particles are just not going to flow well right if you mix it into a powder the real the flow behavior of the mixture is going to be different and depending upon how you how it is uh, distributed consolidation so what shape you can make out of that overall right we are going to try and see some examples of how that gets affected depending upon what powders you start out with you have particles of different sizes shapes packing and so you those spaces between the particles are filled with different kinds of polymers if you're now getting rid of the polymers it has to come out of the pore structure right how is the removal affected right if you go with very fine particles they are going to have a lot of defect sites right so by definition they're going to be highly active catalytically right is that that is going to affect the way the polymer breaks down right so between the diffusion of the organic materials through the pores as well as the catalytic effects of the surface of the powders with the polymers that can be a big problem or it can be something that you have to affect in terms of the changes in the process right. centering behavior right. smaller sizes more surface area more defect sites ease of diffusion at any given temperature right. and then finally properties depending upon the starting size your final size is going to change of the grain and how does that affect overall final properties densification is going to change right what density you can finally achieve and then attributes related to chemistry right some chemistries are going to be more amenable to diffusion more suitable for improving diffusion compared to others maybe a liquid phase forms and diffusion through a liquid is faster than diffusion through a solid right main thing is if packing and flow behavior change your ability to control the film thickness or precision of a three dimensional component is going to be very different how uniformly they are distributed is going to affect these the precision as well as well as the distribution of properties right so powder characteristics related to processing that is sort of the examples that we are going to see again and again through the next few days that and in this class all we have to go away with is i need to know what my powder looks like and i need to know if i can control what happens in the process i can get what i want with the powder that i selected